Um, like Chad said, my name is Martin Toft. I've uh, been with Four Hands Brewing Company since we opened, which, uh, show of hands, who all has been to the brewery so far? That's almost everybody. That's great. All right. For those of you that haven't, uh, we're located on South 8th Street. We're about four blocks south of Bush Stadium. Uh, just a real short hike from downtown. Um, if you haven't been in before, the tasting room's small, but we've got a huge window, and you can look back into the brewery so you can see me and all the other guys making beer every day which is kind of cool. It's a unique feature at Four Hands. Uh, makes it really feel like you're kind of a part of the process. Um, we've been open for about four and a half years now. Uh, I've been there the entire time. So uh, I actually started up with them, I think we were on batch number 10 when I started brewing with Four Hands. So I've uh, been, been with them for a while. Uh, we started out, did not have this diverse portfolio of beers that you see before us. Uh, who here has had our, our core beers? Do you guys know our, our four core that we started out with? We had the Oatmeal Brown, we got at least a few. Uh, we had Single Speed, which was actually a, a Blondale with Elderflower when we first started. Uh, we've since changed that, it's now a Blondale with Jasmine. Uh, a little bit softer, a little bit more floral. Uh, I think all the changes were definitely for the better, but it's just a nice crisp Blondale. Uh, we've got our Divided Sky, which is our flagship IPA. So West Coast style IPA, I'm sure a lot of you tried that before. Um, all those big sea hops, uh, Cascade, Centennial, Columbus. All that Pacific Northwest stuff that's going to be really uh, kind of citrusy, piney. Uh, some of it's a little bit tropical, but this one really leans toward the, the citrusy and piney. Um, and then we used to have our uh, reprised Centennial Red Ale, which has since been replaced by a beer that we're going to try tonight, which is Citywide. Has anybody out there tried a Citywide yet? All right. You guys are the lucky few. So that one uh, actually just came out, but we'll, we'll get to tasting that in a little bit. Um, so a lot of people kind of think that Four Hands was, uh, was the hop forward brewery starting out. And we definitely were. That's uh, the bulk of our portfolio. All of us are huge hop heads at the brewery. Um, we're, we're always looking for that really bitter, piney, citrusy stuff. Um, but since then, we've branched out. We do a lot of different types of beer now. Uh, we do a lot of barrel aging. That's a huge thing that we, uh, we're excited about. We recently we were able to open up uh, our second floor, so we had 7,000 square feet that became available to us, and we turned it into climate-controlled barrel aging. Um, we're currently looking at, and this is not official yet, but an off-site barrel house as well, um, because our barrel pro program has been growing so much, and we just don't have the room to house all the barrels uh, anymore. I'm sorry, what was that? There you go. Yeah, you said there's basements available. Yeah. Uh, I think we got a lot of people in the same boat that would probably love to take a couple of those barrels home. Um, but so we're doing everything now from uh, stuff like we're going to taste today, some big, bold imperial stouts, uh, old ales, barley wines, uh, all the way to, you know, really, really sour stuff. Uh, we just came out with an Oud Brun, which is called Core Values. That's right here. Um, that's actually going to be a prize at the end of the presentation for anyone who can answer a question for me. Um, we also came out with uh, another sour beer called Prelude. Um, we'd already been doing our, our two, um, kind of like the, the first uh, barrel-aged beers that we ever released, uh, two sister beers called Cuvée Ange and Cuvée Diable. Um, anyone had those before? All right, we got a few. So uh, Cuvée Ange is uh, an amber saison that's aged in red wine barrels, mostly Cabernet, Merlot, and Grenache. Um, and it's uh, brewed with Britannomyces bruxellensis, so uh, one of your kind of funky barnyard, barnyard Brett strains. Uh, it's got a lot of those Belgian uh, aromas and flavors that you're used to. And then it's got raspberries and blackberries in there as well. Uh, the other one, Cuvée Diable, uh, which is one of my favorites. It's uh, another amber saison, again, aged in red wine barrels. This one's with tart cherries. So just a, a little bit more on the tart end of the spectrum. Um, definitely uh, one, of, one of the more complex, uh, delicious farmhouse barrel-aged beers that we make. Um, but yeah, so, so our portfolio has really grown since we first started out. Um, and, and a lot of that's just due to the passion of all of our brewers. Um, so starting out, I can tell you there were two of us brewing beer at Four Hands. Uh, now we have 11 full-time guys just on the production side. Uh, we're up to about 30 employees total, which uh, for us, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but for us is very exciting uh, since we started out so small that uh, we're able to have so many people join the family and uh, so many people who are passionate and excited about making great beer. And that's what's really allowed us to, to create this diverse portfolio, because we've got guys who like producing every single style of beer you can think of. You know, whether it's uh, something on the really dark and roasty chocolatey end, to something on the super sour end, to something really Brett funky and barrel-aged, 
uh, to all those crazy bitter IPAs. Uh, we've got somebody who's a fan of every single one of those styles. So it's kind of cool to have people like that on board that you get to work with every day, and you get to make these really exciting and interesting styles. Um, so some of those we brought for you today, and uh, the first one we're going to dive into, looks like we're ready right here, is Citywide. So Citywide, sorry, I'm getting a little feedback there. Uh, Citywide's a brand new beer. Uh, we actually just launched it on the 7th of this month. Sorry, there you go. Uh, it's an American Pale Ale, and it's kind of our tribute to St. Louis. So you can see, obviously, we got the St. Louis flag on there. Uh, the food pairings are some of my favorites, uh, toasted ravioli and pork steaks, uh, which if you're a native, uh, Sa or a St. Louis native, then you'll definitely recognize those as two of our favorite foods. Um, it comes in at about 5.5% ABV. Uh, the hops are a lot of those Pacific Northwest styles that we all love. Uh, it's Simcoe, Citra, and Centennial. Uh, Centennial, personally, is one of my favorite hops. I know it's not uh, one of those new HBC uh, varietals, not, not the exciting new stuff, but it is a beautiful hop. Uh, if anybody's ever had Bell's Two Hearted, uh, one of my favorite beers, that's just, you know, an excellent use of that hop. It is so floral, it's so fruity, it's almost like, a, it smells like a bowl of Fruit Loops when you get that beer in front of you when it's fresh. Um, and you can definitely pick that up on this one. So like I said, 5.5%, uh, not going to be uh, too strong for you, but the aroma definitely comes in. We put a pretty heavy dry hop on it, so that dry hop is going to be all that Centennial, uh, Citra, and Simcoe. Um, we use a little bit of Columbus in the kettle as well, uh, and that's really just our bittering charge. So uh, for, for those of you that are pretty familiar with the brewing process, that's going to be the first hop addition that we put in, and that's the one that gives us the bulk of our IBUs. Um, after that, it's really just all those aroma hops that are going to give us uh, that, that great bouquet that you get on the nose here. So if everyone wants to smell it, you can take a look. Nice uh, kind of golden color to it. And just a nice, crisp, clean bitterness. It's got a little bit of that fruitiness on the back end. Again, that's those Pacific Northwest hops. Um, the biggest part of this, actually, let, let's go ahead and talk about some tasting notes before I dive into the rest of this beer. Um, anybody want to raise their hand, tell me some of the aromas that they get on this beer? Here we go. Yeah, definitely fruity. So that's, that's a huge one for me. It is very fruity, and I get some of that like berry fruitiness too. And I can definitely see the juniper. How about uh, on, the, on the taste? Anybody got any uh, taste descriptors? No? Yeah, juicy fruit. That is actually an excellent one. I, I might start using that. Um, yeah, juicy fruit, for sure. Uh, yeah, and it's just, you know, it's a nice fruity. It kind of makes your mouth water. Uh, and that's what we were going for. We, uh, we did a lot of test batches with this beer trying to get it dialed in perfectly, because we really wanted this to be a beer that, you know, everyone can enjoy. Um, and this beer is only available in St. Louis. So you can only get it here in St. Louis. Uh, we cover a bunch of different markets now, but all of this beer is going to St. Louis, and it's all going to be in 16-ounce cans. Uh, so no draft offerings. Uh, you can see here at Cicero's, they got it in the 16-ounce can. All your favorite bars, they'll have it in the 16-ounce can. Um, and 50 cents off of every four pack of this beer that we sell is going to be donated to local charities. So we, uh, we go with a different charity every quarter. Uh, this first quarter, it's going to be Love Bank Park, which is uh, located off of Cherokee Street, uh, right near our sales and marketing office. Um, and it's just a, a place where the local kids hang out. And it was kind of dilapidated. It was falling apart. And uh, we wanted to do everything we could to improve this space and give local kids uh, a place that they could hang out in a place that, you know, was, was safe and clean and, you know, was, was pleasant to enjoy. So, uh, so that was uh, our, our first one. Um, quarter two, we're going with uh, Grace Hill. Um, so another uh, big community outreach charity. Uh, they're, they're looking at, like, uh, children's early education, uh, community outreach, um, just supporting uh, local, local communities. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, another one that we're, uh, you know, we're, uh, really excited about. Um, after that, we've got uh, the Great Rivers Greenways, uh, so another uh, local trails, uh, trails and pedestrian uh, organization. And uh, all of our uh, proceeds every single quarter will we'll switch from one charity to the next. 
Um, so. Yeah, sorry. So we'll see. Um, that's kind of all up in the air right now because we don't know how much we're going to sell. I can, I can tell you that the first night that we released this beer, we, do, or we, uh, we were able to raise $3,000 overnight for charity. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, that, that was a big figure for us. Um, so if, if uh, sales stay set steady, which I hope they will, um, you can only imagine every quarter we're going to be able to donate a pretty significant amount of money to local charities, which is really the exciting thing for us, because uh, we, you know, we're all local uh, St. Louis residents uh, at the brewery. Uh, most of us were born and raised here, um, and it's just been really humbling and exciting to see how the community has supported us these past four or four and a half years. Um, we really went from, you know, nothing. We started out on a shoestring. Uh, it was a couple of guys working really, really hard, crazy hours just to make beer and be able to get it out the door to people. And everyone gave us so much love and support, and now we're able to, to do what we do now. And so this is our way to give back to the community and support all those people that supported us for so long. Uh, so it's a, it's a project that we are all very excited about. It's something that we really put our hearts and souls into. So we're, we're just happy that people are enjoying the beer so far and that we're going to be able to give this much money every quarter to, to, to different local charities. Um, so while we're waiting on this next beer, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So like I said, I've been with Four Hands for four and a half years. Uh, before that, I was actually fresh out of brewing school. Um, if any of you have, have any of you ever met our president, Kevin Lemp? We got a couple. So uh, I, I was introduced to Kevin by Stephen Hale of uh, Schlafly Brewing Company. Uh, I'd actually done an internship with Stephen uh, some years back, and uh, he, he realized that I would be a good fit for four hands. A lot of people, those of you who know Kevin, will understand. Uh, they said that I was probably hired because Kevin and I look almost identical. <laughs> there's, there's actually no relation, but uh, if you saw the two of us standing side by side, you probably wouldn't be able to pick one against the other. Um, so, I don't know if there was some sort of uh, non-nepotism, nepotism going on there, but uh, eh, whatever the backstory is, I'm just happy I got the job. Um, so, since then, um, it's been a wild ride with four ants. Uh, I started out as an assistant brewer. Um, and quickly got bumped up to, to brewery manager and uh, have kind of been running our day-to-day -day operations since then. Um, and it's just been a, a lot of fun being able to be involved in such a cool company. You know, um, Four Hands is, it's probably one of those dream jobs that, you know, you, you never think that you're ever going to get a job like this, but when you do, it's just so much fun. Every, every day is like going to hang out with your friends. So it, it's cool. It's definitely an exciting thing that, uh, that I get to be a part of it. And uh, it's very rewarding getting to hang out with you guys on days like this and see everybody enjoy the beer. Um, so uh, we're, we're getting ready to pour this next one. Um, and for this tasting, we're going to kind of start with uh, some of the hoppier ones. And we'll get around to the, uh, the darker beers at the end here, which will actually, uh, some of those will also be giveaways at the end of this. Uh, we've got a, a Devil's Invention and a Bonafide up here that'll be some, some question giveaways. So make sure you pay attention to some of this stuff. Uh, so this next one, uh, we're diving right into Contact High. Anybody here had a Contact High before? All right. I kind of I thought that might be the case. It's like, we are talking about the beer, though, just to clarify. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Contact High is uh, one of our six-month seasonals. Uh, it, it alternates with Chocolate Milk Stout. So Chocolate Milk Stout is going to be our fall, winter, Contact High, spring, summer. So this one just came out for the season. Um, this is one of my personal favorites this time of year. Uh, and the reason I like it so much is just that it's so refreshing on a warm day like today. It's, you know, it's really crisp, it's really citrusy. Uh, before I dive right into it, we'll start off with the flavor descriptors first this time before I lead you guys in a direction. Um, anyone want to tell me what they smell? Any, uh, any aroma descriptors? You got anybody? Citrus, all right, yeah. I definitely get a lot of citrus. And the reason you get a lot of citrus is that there's a lot of citrus in this beer. Um, so this, uh, this beer is an American wheat beer. Um, we call it a hoppy wheat. And the reason we call it a hoppy wheat is because we put a lot of hops in it. Um, so it's an American wheat. We also put a lot of citrus in it. So in the kettle, uh, I should say in the whirlpool, actually. So at the end of the boil, uh, we put a lot of orange zest in there. 
Uh, we use two different types of uh, orange zest or orange peel. Uh, we use a, a bitter orange peel and we use a sweet orange peel. Uh, gives it a very round citrusy aroma and flavor. And then the bulk of the citrus comes from not only the hops, which this is, could, could almost be said to be a single hop beer. It's primarily Cascade. There's a little bit of Centennial in there. Again, you guys can probably tell by the end of this, I'm a big fan of Centennial, so we use a lot of Centennial. Um, but uh, there's a little bit of Centennial in there, but it's mostly Cascade, which Cascade is a great citrusy hop. Um, so it gives it a lot of that orange just on its own before we even throw the rest of that orange zest in, which we do throw a lot of orange zest in. So uh, at the end, yeah. Um, so, so in the, in the boil, uh, it's about two five-gallon buckets per 15-barrel batch. Uh, the key, though, the thing that really gives it that bright citrus is in the bright tank. So the bright tank would be the conditioning tank. Uh, it's the tank that we put the beer in right before we package it. Um, and we do, uh, as far as I know, a fairly unique process. I don't know of any other breweries that are doing it. Uh, we actually hand zest oranges. Um, we hand zest them, we collect all that zest, and then we press that zest to extract the oil. And that's what we add in. So rather than using uh, you know, some commercially bought extract or flavoring or something like that, we actually hand process all these oranges. Uh, we've got a guy named Chris who spends a lot of hours zesting oranges and uh, pressing oranges so that we can make this beer. Um, and then uh, from there, we add that oil directly into the bright tank. So. No, uh, surprisingly no. So you can see I haven't even taken a sip of this yet. We still got a decent head sitting on there. Um, no, the, uh, the oil is so acidic. Uh, it's not like that olive oily oil that you think of. So it doesn't really kill the head retention that you, 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 the way you'd think it would. Um, more so, it just imparts a really bright, uh, like crisp and fresh smell. It smells like you squeezed an orange, you know, uh, right when you get this out of the bright tank. So yeah, citrus. You definitely get some citrus on there, yeah. The orange centers. Uh, so, so no, the question was, do we press, press the orange centers as well? Do we juice the oranges? Um, we do not. Um, no. So, so what we do is we either uh, donate those zested oranges to local restaurants. Uh, a lot of the times we give them to our farmers who collect our spent grain, and they'll feed them to their pigs or their cattle. Uh, the other thing we do is we like to make fruity alcoholic drinks with them for all the guys in the brewery to drink. So <laughs> that's uh, another good use. But um, yeah, we, we don't use any of the juice, we just use that zest. And that's, we just want that really bright, aromatic orange oil. That's all we're looking for. Um, the question was, has this recipe changed year to year? Uh, so we have, we've made some subtle tweaks to it. We've definitely increased the amount of orange. That's one thing. Uh, we have also changed the way we process that orange. Originally, we were just putting orange zest directly into the bright tank. And we found out that we had to use an incredible amount of oranges to get the same flavor that we do now by pressing that zest. And that we just weren't as satisfied with how, how bright and fragrant that aroma was. It was, the hop profile has not changed. This is almost, uh, has always been an almost, like I said, single hop beer. So, you know, 98% of the hops that are going into this beer are all Cascade. Um, and that's, yeah, it's always been the same. Uh, crop years of Cascade have changed, obviously, year to year, but yeah, uh, the, the bulk of it's always been Cascade. Yep. Um, so yeah, uh, on the flavor here, uh, I just got around to tasting this. It took me a little bit. But um, say so yeah, it definitely is a little bit bitter. But like a lot of our hoppy beers, we actually keep the IBUs on this pretty darn low. This is about 30 IBUs. So if you're used to your typical IB, IPA, you know, you're talking 60 plus. There are a lot that are so bitter you actually can't taste all the bitterness. It's, it's above the flavor threshold. Um, we actually take a lot of care in making sure that we keep our IBUs pretty low. Uh, and the reason we do that is that we want you to be able to experience the flavor of the beer and not just the bitterness. So a lot of that, you know, that bitterness can be kind of overwhelming to the palate. Um, and that's always my complaint with a lot of these big IPAs. Don't get me wrong, I do love them. I love big IPAs, but you can't get all that flavor when your palate's just completely wrecked with all that bitterness. So we try and throttle back the IVUs so that you can really appreciate the, the more delicate flavors that those hops contribute. So you'll find that, uh, you know, with, with a few exceptions, most of our APAs, pale ales, stuff like that, they're going to be closer to the 30 to 40 IBU range. 
Um, some of our bigger stuff might be closer to the 60s or so, but we're, we're never really pushing that 100 plus IBU mark. That's just not something that we, uh, we ever wanted to do. We, we just like the more delicate flavors of the hop. We have any more questions about this beer? No? All right. Well, then uh, it looks like it's almost time to move on to the next one. So this one's going to be a little bit deceptive. It looks like you're about to get a stout. It's not a stout, though. <laughs> um, this one's going to be a black IPA, which was a style that, uh, before we drink it, none of us at the brewery ever thought we were going to want to brew. Uh, none of us had ever brewed a black IPA, and none of us had ever tasted a black IPA that we'd really liked. Um, a black IPA is kind of a divisive style. Um, mainly what it is is it's an IPA that's black, which is actually uh, also uh, kind of a misnomer because IPA is India Pale Ale, and you can't have a black India Pale Ale, right? That doesn't make any sense. can't be black and pale. Thank you. Um, but we went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, we did it because we thought it might be fun. We were going to experiment with it. We were going to see how it turned out. And this, this one's called Alter Ego, which I got the can right here, which is clearly not a ripoff of Two-Face from Batman. I'll say that right now uh, in case anybody was thinking it. Um, so a black IPA, uh, also known as a Cascadian Dark Ale, which gets around that misnomer uh, oxymoron about a black pale ale. Um, it was something that we, you know, we never thought that we could make a good black IPA because we never had a good black IPA until we made this beer. And we all tried it and we thought, damn, that's a pretty good black IPA. <laughs> all right, I guess you can do this. Um, and the way that we did it is actually uh, fairly unique. Um, so there are a few ways that you can approach a black IPA. You can use uh, a lot of dark malts. You could use, you know, like a roasted barley. You could use a, a carafa or something like that something that's been uh, really highly roasted, you know, similar to really highly roasted coffee that's super, super dark. Um, and that, the risk you run with that is that you end up with a lot of those big, bold, roasty flavors and aromas. You know, you end up with a stout that has hops in it, um, which there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you're going for, but that's not something that we were looking to do. We wanted something that tasted like an IPA but kind of looked like a stout. So we went a different route. So if you look at this, that looks... Pretty pitch black, right? You might be able to see like a little bit of red coming around the corners, but it's it's pretty darn dark. The aroma though doesn't smell super roasty. Anybody getting anything really roasty off of this? Any chocolatey, anything like that? More so you get the hops. And the hops that we use on this, uh, primarily it's Zythos. Uh, Zythos is a proprietary blend, but it's all Pacific Northwest hops. So it's again all those citrusy, piney, somewhat tropical hops. And we use a little bit of citra as well, which similar similar flavor, flavor and aroma profile. But the reason that you don't smell any chocolate or any roast on that, you don't get those coffee notes, is that we don't use uh, you know, highly uh, roasted malt. We use a product called Cinnamar. Has anyone ever heard of Cinnamar before? All right, maybe, we got one. We have maybe a few home brewers out there who might have used Cinnamar. Uh, Cinnamar is a product made by Weyermann, which Weyermann is a maltster out of Germany. Um, and what it is, is they take one of their highly roasted, their highly roasted malts called Carafa. Uh, it's actually a dehusked malt, which means they take the husk off, because that husk is what contributes a lot of those really bitter uh, tannic flavors. So that kind of like uh, dark chocolate or like bitter coffee, the stuff that you get off of the stout. Uh, so that, a lot of that's contained in the husk. They take the husk off, and then they actually uh, use vacuum evaporation to make an extract out of it. So they, they make like a thick syrup out of this uh, debittered black malt, and that's called Cinnamar. And the great thing about Cinnamar is you can put it in and it'll give you all that color. You know, it'll give you a pitch black beer, but it won't contribute a lot of those, those roasty and chocolatey flavors that would be great if we were looking at a stout, but when you're looking at a black IPA, it's the stuff you're trying to avoid. So Cinnamar is really what allows us to make this beer what it is. It makes, us, uh, you know, makes a nice piney, citrusy beer with, if we can go ahead and taste it, very little of that chocolate roasty character. So, you know, if we were to get this in an opaque glass or if you were drinking it out of the can, there's a good chance that you might never know that you're drinking a black beer. You got a question? So it's from the grain. Sorry, I should have specified there. So they, 
they take the husk off. The husk is what contributes all that bitterness, and they leave just the, the grain. Uh, so just that, that starchy endosperm, the center of the grain, right? And they, they make uh, a wort out of it, you know, the same way that we would brew beer. And then they use vacuum evaporation to condense that down into a syrup. And so we have a liquid product that uh, contributes all that color without any of the, the flavor and aroma. Uh, we got any other questions about this beer? Yeah, in the back. That's a good question. So have I found a black IPA that I've liked since we made this beer? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I found a couple, and I think that people have really made a lot of progress with black IPAs. Like when, uh, when we were designing this beer, a lot of us had tried the early black IPAs, which were a lot more like hoppy stouts. Um, and so it was just kind of, uh, there's nothing wrong with them, and a lot of people love them, but it wasn't a flavor combination that any of us really enjoyed. It was just too roasty and too chocolatey, and when you pair that with the bitterness, it was, it, for me, it was always really unpleasant. Um, but since then, uh, I, I have uh, Wookie Jack is a great one that I like a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I've tried a few others, and there, there are actually some good ones out there now. So I'm glad to say that black IPAs are actually are going up. They're, they're getting better. People are doing a better job with black IPAs. Uh, any other questions about this one? So uh, IBUs on this one uh, are actually a little bit higher. So let me consult my cheat sheet here. Uh, 54 IBUs. So this is a little bit lower than like our flagship IPA, which would be at about 57. But um, 54 IBUs still for an IPA, pretty darn low. And, and again, like I said, we just don't, we're not crazy about ramping the IB, IBUs crazy high on all of our beers because we want you to be able to enjoy all the, the subtleties of, you know, that Zythos and that Citra that we put in there. Um, the rest of this, uh, the malt bill on this beer, so actually before we add the Cinnamar, uh, you'd be surprised. It, it'd be probably lighter than that guy. So you can, you can kind of see the difference. It's uh, pretty much all uh, a pale ale base, pale ale malt base. Um, so yeah, really, really light. Not a lot of crazy stuff going on. Uh, again, we didn't put any of those caramel malts or any of those, uh, you know, roasty malts or anything in there because we wanted it to be super clean. You know, we wanted it to be a really, really clean IPA. And uh, yeah, so all that color just comes from the Carafa. Or sorry, the Carafa-based uh, Cinemar, I should say. Uh, we got any other questions about it? No? All right. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of this beer. Um, so this beer was actually uh, originally brewed just for uh, Llewellyn's. Uh, anybody been to Llewellyn's before? Yeah, all right. We got a few. Um, so they, uh, they reached out to us, and they wanted us to brew a beer just for them to put on tap. And that's how we came up with this. And it, we, we did a lot of back and forth with those guys, uh, really dialing in this recipe. And uh, this is what we came up with. In our first year, it was actually just a 15-barrel batch. So 15-barrel batch is not a lot of beer, uh, comparatively, I should say. Uh, what's that? Uh, no, I think that's Schlafly that does the Dragon Ale. Yeah. So no, this one actually went out as uh, the name was Alter Ego on it. Um, yeah, and, and that first year we just did those 15 barrels, and uh, this year, for example, we did, uh, I believe, 180 barrels, so a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more on that one. Um, all right, it looks like we're ready to dive into the next one. Uh, so the next one is called Devil's Invention. Anybody had this one before? We got a few. Okay. Uh, so this is our, uh, our coffee stout. This is a new one this year. Yeah, we got a fan of coffee stout there. All right. Um, so yeah, this is a new one this year. Uh, we'd never done a really big coffee stout before. We'd had Bonafide, which we're going to taste in a second here. But uh, there's a lot of other really interesting and complex stuff going on with that beer. This is the first one we'd done that was just coffee. Um, so if you want to go ahead and smell this beer, I would guess the first thing that everybody's going to get on the aroma is probably coffee. <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, it's a coffee beer. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. Anybody else got any other uh, any other descriptors on this on the nose? Chocolate for sure. Yeah. Um, so there there's no chocolate that goes into this beer, um, but there is a lot of chocolate malt. Uh, so chocolate malt obviously smells like chocolate. And again, that's a, a fairly highly roasted malt, so it's pretty dark. Um, but it's going to give you some of that uh, like that bitter dark chocolate aroma. Yeah. Question. 
We do. Um, so we, the question was, do we use a specific coffee? Uh, we do use a specific coffee. Uh, on almost all of our coffee projects that we've done, we work with uh, Goshen, uh, so local coffee roaster. Um, this one is actually a blend that they did for us. Uh, it's 50% uh, natural process Bali and 50% uh, Guatemalan. Um, so two uh, somewhat different coffees, but uh, they're in uh, Edwardsville, Illinois. Yep. Yeah, so not, not too far, just over the river. Um, and if you're ever looking for their products, uh, most local schnooks, I know, absolutely have them. Um, and they, they make some great stuff. And they also have a reserve series that's a little bit more uh, difficult to find called their Secret Stash. And that's like a lot of those uh, natural processed stuff, a lot of like that really like cranberry, uh, bright cherry stuff. You like it? All right. We got one fan at least. So uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, taste it real quick. And again, I'm going to guess the, the main descriptor that most people get is probably coffee. <laughs> uh, this one is, we use a lot of coffee in this. So for, uh, for every 15 barrel batch of this, we use 20 pounds of coffee, um, which is a pretty decent amount of coffee. Um, yeah, question in the back. So the question was, what's our process for adding the coffee? Um, so we, we tried a lot of different uh, processes for getting coffee into a beer. So we, we did all sorts of stuff. Um, we, we started out doing uh, cold toddies. We even did uh, Kyoto drips, which I don't know if you've ever seen those. It's like those big towers that you put coffee in and it drips through it over the course of like 24 hours or something. It's crazy. Um, yeah, we did, we did cold press. We did, uh, we did all that stuff. But what we uh, found worked the best is we actually do a fairly coarse grind on the coffee beans. And uh, after we crash the beer, so after we chill that beer down at the end of fermentation, we put the coffee straight in the fermenter. So we just toss it in. Uh, and the thing that allowed us to start doing this was that we got a centrifuge. So does anybody know what a centrifuge is? We got a couple. So a centrifuge is basically uh, a rapid sedimentation device. So it's, uh, it's got a bowl on it. Uh, ours is about this wide. Um, and it spins around really, really fast. We pump beer into it. it spins at about 8,600 RPMs per minute. Or RPM, sorry, not per minute. That's repetitive. <laughs> but and it drops out uh, everything that's in that beer. So all the yeast, uh, any excess proteins, any hot particulate, and in this case, all the coffee grounds. Um, and it, the really neat thing is that we could have never brewed beers like this before we had our centrifuge, because we would have ended up with a bright tank full of coffee beans, and you guys would have ended up with kegs and bottles of beer full of coffee beans, which probably would have tasted great, but it might have been a little gritty. Um, so uh, we, we put those coffee beans uh, ground up right in the fermenter, and then after we run it through the centrifuge, it drops out, and we get a nice, uh, obviously this one's very dark, so not clear beer, but a sediment-free beer um, that then we can package. Got any other questions? That's a question I get a lot. The question is, how much caffeine is in this? Um, I'm sorry to say I've never done the math. The math gets very complicated. Uh, I would definitely say it's less than one cup of coffee per beer. It's probably less than one cup of coffee per every like six beers or so. Yeah. So yeah, with, with the cold press, yeah, it, it's probably, it, it's not as much coffee as you'd think. We get a lot of flavor and we get a lot of aroma, but the caffeine content is not that high. Um, yeah, suffice to say, if you decided to drink, you know, five or ten of these, I think the, the beer would get you before the coffee got you. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, we got any other questions about this beer? Yeah, right in the front here. I'm sorry, say that again, I didn't hear you. Uh, the question was, do we have oats in it? We do not. Uh, we have no oats in it. Um, yep, yeah, question right here. Um, so the, the question was, is there wheat in the beer? And there is wheat. Um, but there's not wheat in the way that you would normally think that there's wheat in a beer. We don't use like a, a white wheat or a winter wheat or anything. We use a, a product called Midnight Wheat, uh, which if we've got any home brewers out there, it's from Brees Malting. Um, again, it's a uh, dehusked uh, wheat. So none of those like tannins, uh, none of that super bitter stuff, but it gets a lot of color into your beer. So we do use, uh, you know, some chocolate malt. We use some roasted barley. We give all the stuff that, you know, you'd usually find in a stout. 
um, but we don't use, uh, or I guess I should say we use that midnight wheat to polish it off the rest of the way to make a nice pitch black beer without it being overly roasty or uh, too chocolatey or, you know, too bitter for you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, so this is a, it's actually a three month seasonal and we're at the end of the run right now. We just released the last batch of this beer last week. So if you guys want this beer, get it now because it's going to be gone soon. I think we've got, you know, a hundred or so cases left in stock at our distributor. And after that, it, it's all going to be gone. Um, so I would imagine you got probably another month or so before this beer totally disappears. We got a question right here. Um, so the question is, where is our beer available? Uh, specifically, where is Devil's Invention available? Um, I would imagine uh, pretty much every Schnucks location has it. Uh, Lucas Liquor, Randall's, uh, Wine and Cheese Place, um, yeah, Total Wine, Fryer Tuck, uh, all the big liquor retailers, beer retailers, they're going to have it. Um, Deerberg's might, I can't say for sure. Um, Brian might have a better idea. Yeah, he doesn't know. <laughs> What's that? Uh, it will be a seasonal, but it's at the end of its seasonal run. So we're, we're on the last month right now. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, another question. Uh, so it came out, let's see what, we're in uh, April now. It came out two months ago. Yeah, so yeah, it's been out for two months. Yep. Um, good question. The IBUs on uh, Devil's Invention are low, extremely low. Let me, uh, a little bit higher than that. You're, you're talking about 28. So funny, yeah, funny thing. Uh, we tasted some of these hoppier beers and you know, you taste like this citywide or this contact high and you think like, wow, that's a really hoppy, bitter beer. But you look at it next to this and you don't think that's a very hoppy, bitter beer. IBUs are almost the same. So that's just the difference that, you know, uh, the malt, uh, the body of the beer can give to it. Yeah, we got another question. Uh, you, sorry, the question was where can you buy these uh, schnooks? You can buy it at schnooks, definitely. Uh, all the big liquor retailers. Uh, so yeah, Lucas, Fryer Tux, Wine and Cheese, um, Randall's, all those guys. They'll, they'll definitely have it. Total Wine. Yeah. Another question right in the front. Uh, ABV on this one is about 7%. Yep. Yeah, so for 7%, fairly smooth. You know, not a, not a super boozy 7%. Um, so yeah, that, that one's kind of a part of our winter portfolio. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of stouts that come out in the winter, so we're, oh, sorry, another question? Oh, they are starting the, uh, or sorry. Uh, okay, you can go ahead, that's fine. Uh, uh, so for the last beer, Cinemar, um, uh, the, the question was how do we discover stuff like Cinemar? Um, so Cinemar is actually, Cinemar is not the proprietary blend, that's the Zythos, which are the hops. So the Zythos hops are a blend of different hops. Um, and uh, we, we talk to our hop supplier pretty frequently. Um, we're pretty much in constant contact with them. I probably annoy the living hell out of our hop supplier um, because we're always trying to find new varietals. Uh, we're trying to keep up to date with uh, what, they, what they have available. Um, hop contracts, so right now we're, we're contracted out four years into the future for all of our hops. Um, because hops are pretty difficult to grow. You know, uh, it's very difficult to increase uh, the quantity that you produce as a farmer. So as, as a brewer, it's really difficult for us to get more of them when we want them. Uh, there are also over 4,000 craft breweries now in the US, and uh, they also want hops too. So uh, we're pretty much always fighting other breweries. I shouldn't say fighting. We're in competition with other breweries for hops. Um, so we, we really stay on top of our hop uh, suppliers trying to figure out when we can get new varietals, uh, if they've shifted any of their contracts, if there's any more available for us to buy of certain types that we really like. We always try and bother them about that so that we really know we can get exactly what we want when we want it. Another question. Yeah, so the, the address of our brewery downtown, uh, it's 1220 South 8th Street. For anyone who hasn't been there, uh, we're located just four blocks south of Bush Stadium. Um, we're right by the 7th Street exit off of 44. 
Uh, and if you pull off there, you can't miss us. We got a big sign that says Four Hands Brewing Company in the back. Uh, we've got a tasting room there, uh, just a little over a couple thousand square feet for our tasting room, but we're actually in the process of building out a second tasting room on our second floor. Uh, so we'll have about another 4,500 square feet up there. Um, so we'll have a lot of space, because if any of you have been in on the weekends, it can get kind of crowded. Yeah, question? That's a good question. So the question is, why are all of our anniversary beers Wizard of Oz themed? Um, and the answer to that, yeah. So I, I do love that movie. The answer to that is I have no idea. I have absolutely no clue. Um, our president, for some reason, year one, decided he wanted to name the first anniversary beer after the Wizard of Oz, and it's just kept going since then. I don't know if he'd watched it recently. I don't know if it came to him in a dream. Uh, I have no idea, but we, we started doing it, and we just kept it going year after year because we kind of thought it was a fun theme, and uh, it gave us some cool artwork to play with and a cool story to put behind each one. But, yeah, to answer your question, there's, there's no real reason. We just thought it was cool. Thank you. All right. So we are finally moving on to the last beer, which is Bonafide. Anybody out there had Bonafide before? We got a few. All right. Anybody have Bonafide the first year that we brewed it? We got a couple. Uh, so that would have been 2012 would have been the first time that we released Bonafide. Okay. So since then, this beer has actually changed a lot. Uh, most of our beers have stayed pretty consistent. We've only made a few minor tweaks to them. This one we've changed uh, quite a bit about. Uh, it was you know, our first time brewing a Russian Imperial Stout, and it just didn't turn out the way that we wanted it to, so we made some tweaks. And uh, I think it's all for the better. So this one's a Russian Imperial Stout. Uh, it's brewed with coffee. Uh, again, it's that same blend of a natural processed Bali and uh, a Guatemalan from Goshen. Um, and it's also brewed with vanilla beans. Um, so if we go ahead and smell it, uh, the, the first thing I get on the smell, I think the dominant thing, um, is that definitely that coffee. That coffee is just so dominant. Uh, it, it always kind of takes over. But on the back end, if you kind of stick with it, you start to get that vanilla. Uh, and it's a little bit more subtle, but it's definitely there. Yeah, we got a question right here. Uh, the one that we're drinking right now, it's called Bonafide, is the name of this beer, Bonafide. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the statement was the, the vanilla makes the coffee sweet, which it does. So you get, you get that strong coffee aroma, but you definitely get, for me, it always comes off as marshmallows whenever you have a lot of vanilla in a beer. So I get marshmallows on it. Yeah, question here. Yes, so it tastes like a dessert was the statement. It does taste like a dessert. And uh, this is kind of designed to almost be a dessert beer. And one of the pairings on here is even uh, dark chocolate. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a dessert beer. And yeah, and cigars. Which, if we got any cigar smokers, another excellent pairing. Yeah, question. No. So there, the question was, is there any chocolate in this? There's not any chocolate in this. Surprisingly. Uh, so we do use chocolate malt. Uh, we also use a lot of caramel malts, which are going to, again, give it some of those, those really sweet, uh, not, more, not chocolatey, but more like candy sweet and uh, some, like, some of that dried raisin and stuff like that, caramel. Um, but a lot of what that you're getting on that chocolate, in my experience at least, is uh, you get that bold chocolate malt, so a lot of that chocolatey roasty nose, and then the vanilla. So if you ever uh, buy... Uh, certain chocolate extracts or something like that at the store, you'll notice that they have a little bit of vanilla in it. Same thing if you ever brew anything with a lot of chocolate in it. Uh, they'll tell you to put a little vanilla in there too, because vanilla actually rounds out that flavor of chocolate. And it actually, uh, a lot of what we know is the, uh, the aroma of chocolate, it's got a little bit of vanilla in there. So that actually gives it more of a chocolatey nose. Sorry, you had a question here? Uh, good, good question. So the question was, how do we figure out what foods uh, pair, pair well with all of our beers? Because we put on all of our labels our food pairings. Um, a lot of it is just our anecdotal experience. It's stuff that, you know, we've had beers like this or we've had this exact beer while it was in the development stage with a certain food and it was perfect. Um, and, then, and a lot of it's just uh, having experience in, you know, trying other beers, knowing what flavor combinations go, to well, go well together. Uh, if you're ever trying to figure something out like that, uh, Brewmaster's Table 
uh, by Garrett Oliver is a great resource, really good book. Uh, and he does a lot of uh, work on kind of pairing food and beer. Um, we also use a book called The Flavor Bible a lot when we're coming up with uh, new beers. And that's basically just a great resource for looking at one flavor. Say we want to put, you know, lime in a beer or something like that. And we say, what, what goes well with lime? What else could we put in here? We look at The Flavor Bible. And uh, it has a lot of great ideas, and that gives us a good jumping off point.